Is anybody still outside walking laps? We need to get them back inside. <laughs> Tell them to come back in. All right, this morning I talked to you a little bit about, uh, or touched on a subject about anxiety. And thought tonight, since we touched on it, I'd come back to it uh, uh, and, and maybe do a little more in-depth look into that. Does anybody here deal with, don't raise your hand, but, but I think everybody may deal with some levels of worry and, and then maybe some things we get overly concerned about. And uh, sometimes we may bring that to an art of, of kind of letting stuff build up and then we can just take our eyes off the faithfulness of God and the blessings of God and we tend to put our mindset completely on an issue, whatever it may be. Tonight, I want to, I actually just kind of went back to some of the biblical counseling uh, notes that I like to do and uh, thought we'd just kind of have a lesson of, of let's take a hard look at maybe where this comes from and maybe some ways to deal with it. So if you uh, uh, find yourself fearful or if you find yourself worrying or you find yourself anxious about things, my prayer tonight is that we might be able to biblically uh, get some answers and then maybe put some things into practice. I'm not going to cover this tonight, but let me, let me tell you something that will help you immensely. I don't know about you, but sometimes I kind of like to see something. I kind of like to see it. If, if you'll take an inventory of your day, whatever it may be, and you don't have to, I mean, I'm talking, talking about doing a journal or a diary or anything like that, but if you break your day into, say, 30-minute segments, just 30-minute segments, and you kind of go through your day and you list the things that you do, uh, you know, you may uh, wake up at a certain time, you may drink your coffee, you may have your quiet time, uh, you, some people would maybe walk in the mornings, whatever it may be. But, but be truthful as you walk through it. And I'm going to tell you something that you may find. You'll find a few areas that are sort of wasting uh, time that could be better spent. And, and, uh, and it may be some things that aren't beneficial to your spiritual walk. And it's some of those things that normally become a gateway to worry and fear. And, and, uh, or, or at least uh, uh, the perception of it. So I think that if we could do a little bit of an inventory of sort of how, where we spend our mind and just kind of go through it and think about it. You don't have to do it all in a day. Nothing, nothing, I'm just telling you. Do a little inventory. And the things that aren't productive whatsoever to your mental, spiritual well-being, take them out. Just eliminate them. And, uh, of course, I'm a big, if you're going to take something out, replace it and put something in that would be beneficial. And I think that you will find that some of the areas that you get so anxious about will begin to fade. And, uh, and if, if I need to go in deeper with anybody on that, just see me privately and we can kind of work that out and I can explain that a little bit better uh, than I just did. But I got a few scriptures I want to share with you. And as I go through them, I want you to kind of help me. We're going we're gonna to go back and forth a little bit here. Uh, so let's just imagine that we're sitting in my living room and we're talking about these scriptures. And uh, so I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to let some of you reply back, okay? Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Jesus is talking about uh, uh, being worried and adding inches to our height or, 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 or whatever, just anything we can worry about and make it happen. Uh, and then in verse 33, he says, But seek ye first um, uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Just sufficient of the day is trouble. So Jesus here is, is he's telling us that the first thing we should do and let first things be first, he tells us to do what? Seek. And what are we to be seeking? We seek his kingdom. Do y'all remember the Lord's Prayer? What is a part of the Lord's Prayer concerning the kingdom? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so if we're seeking the kingdom of God, we're seeking for God's will to be accomplished, okay? So Jesus says, seek first his kingdom. So if you're going through and doing that little inventory and you've got all kind of things robbing your day and your mind and your peace that aren't adding one iota to your relationship to Christ, if you can remove some of those and replace some of those, um, um, i tell you something, I'm, I'm, I'm not as big as music person as, as and nothing about music, nothing negative. I love the old hymns and all that. 
I don't care for some of the modern music at all that, that we see. Uh, but I have discovered a classic, which classic means like a long time ago. That's what I'm learning. That's what that means. And I'm learning that oldies is me. So uh, I found some classic uh, worship uh, that, that I have thoroughly enjoyed. And I actually know just about every song that I've been listening to lately. And I have been enjoying that. And let me tell you something. An hour of worship, thinking about the faithfulness and goodness of God versus an hour of talk radio news. Which one do you think is better for your peace and your well-being? It, it's just worship and scripture and thinking about the Lord. And so there's just some things that, that I'm doing that, that I think is important. So we seek first the kingdom of God and we seek first the righteousness of God. That's what we're going to seek first. And then Jesus makes a promise. All these things are going to be added to you. But look what he says. Therefore, because of that, he said, don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't be so fretful. Okay? Why, can we, why don't we have to worry? Why don't we have to worry? God's going to provide. God's going to give us what we need. Okay? So if gas goes up to $25 a gallon, which I don't think it will, but if it did, is worrying going to put gas in your tank? Not at all. It's, it's, it's kind of like that old saying, worry is like rocking in a chair. It gives you something to do, but you ain't going nowhere. You won't go a place. You're just rocking. And that's all worry is going to do. Worry will never, ever accomplish anything. Okay? Keep that in mind. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Philippians 4, verses, well, I'm just going to look at verse 6. Let's just look at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So be anxious for nothing. You don't have to worry about anything. You need to pray about everything. Well, if I'm praying about it instead of worrying about it, isn't that seeking first God's kingdom and his will and his purpose? It is. It is. Okay? 1 John 4.18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So, so when there's fear and we're afraid, what we've done is we've taken away our mindset of the one who we are to fear, which is the Lord our God, the beginning of wisdom. Perfect love casts out that fear. Well, how does that happen? <coughs> when my kids were little, they, including my wife, were absolutely convinced that they saw someone standing outside our window in a new house we had just moved into. They were so convinced that they saw, do you remember that, Tracy? It was the shadow and, and, and uh, when they, and, and I, I actually, as convinced they were, I'm not so sure it wasn't somebody. So I'm not, not saying that it didn't happen. But they all came to daddy husband. And that meant daddy husband was now to go out there and deal with that shadow figure that they had seen. Well, as I went to take care of it, guess what? They weren't afraid anymore. Why? Because they took their mind off the thing that created the fear, and I'm not God by any means, but they put their eyes on the person who they knew would go out there and deal with anything that might be going on. We, we do this all the time. If we have a medical something that scares the fire out of us, we can Google it, and then we think we're dying. Or, or heaven forbid, if you go to WebMD and answer five of their questions, you're dead. You're gone. Go ahead and call the funeral home after that because it's going to lead off with the worst. But chances are you're probably going to go see a doctor, and you're going to let them try to find out what it is that caused what caused you. to. And then from there, you may find some comfort if it's, if it's not anything. So... Fear is something that can just take over if you're not careful. 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul talking to young Timothy, he said, God has not given you a spirit of timidity or fear, 
but God has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. So that's what God has given us. Now, hear me out. We don't have a spirit of fear given to us. What God has given us is power, love, and a sound mind. Some people don't realize that God has empowered you to live a life that rises above anxiety, fear, apprehension, worry, and all of this. God has given us a sound mind whereby we can perceive the promises of God and we can see and remember the faithfulness of God and it should allow us to overcome these things. Now I'm going to kind of walk through some of this. Some of it is kind of a uh, choppy, maybe not quite like a normal sermon would be. But I don't really want to miss anything. But the first thing I want to tell you, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write three words. Fear, worry, anxiety. Fear, worry, anxiety. I think we all know what those words are. Now here's what, here's, I'm telling you the truth what I'm fixing to tell you. Fear, worry, and anxiety are sins. Their sins. Why can I say that? Because when the Bible says don't and we do, it's disobedience. Okay? Now we got to ask ourselves why I'm doing it. There's a reason. But I wanted to start with just a just a truth bomb here. Fear, worry, and anxiety are sins. And these sins can paralyze our mind. It can shut down this sound mind that God has given us. We can become so, I mean, the truth is, we can become so hyper-focused on whatever it is causing us fear, anxiety, uh, 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 the other word I use, it, it, we can become so focused on that that all of a sudden we don't even think rational anymore. We start thinking the what ifs or what's next, or it's over. And we can get so wrapped up in that that we literally paralyze our thoughts. Not only that, it can affect you physically. Those that struggle with anxiety and worry, have you ever noticed how it causes your heart to palpitate? Your stomach can become upset. You ever notice that? Well, why on earth is all that happening? Well, God gave us some responses to fear. God, in those same responses to fear, we tend to release when we're anxious and we're nervous and we're fretful. It's kind of the fight or flight. We flood our bodies uh, with adrenaline. And that adrenaline is there for us to fight or to run. And if we're not doing any, but we're letting that same, it affects us physically. It can raise your blood pressure. It can affect your blood sugar. It can affect your digestion. It can affect your sleep, which then affects a million other things. All of this because of fear and worry and anxiety. And not only can it cause a mental paralysis, not only can it cause physical harm, it interferes with your spiritual growth. So these three little words... These sinful attitudes can affect us in our mind, can affect us in our body, and can affect us spiritually. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but that's what happens. Now, I don't say that because I'm smart, and I don't say that because uh, 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 I learned it or I read it. We just go to Scripture. Where on earth did fear and worry and anxiety start in our Bibles? What is the first described case of fear and anxiety and worry that we have in our big old Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Where is our very first example of it? Adam and Eve right after sin. They recognized they were naked. That was a shame. That was because of sin. That was because of spiritual uh, death that occurred in them. And then they knew that they were going to have an audience with God, which they had daily. And what were they doing? They sowed fig leaves, and then they hid because they were afraid. 
They were afraid. See, sin always brings these things. And these, and in this case, Eve sinned and Adam sinned against God's spoken word. But with that brought these three words, these attributes. So here's where we need to draw one simple conclusion. And I want you to hear this. Satan is the one behind the obstacles that these three things, fear, worry, and anxiety, bring in our life. Satan is the one who magnifies that. It is not God. God has given us everything that we need to overcome these things. So we're either going to listen to the enemy, and part of this he uses our flesh to do, or we're going to listen and believe God. So which one would you want to do? I think I want to listen to God. Let's look at some situations that tempt us to fear and worry. Now, I'm going to name a few things, and, and I want to look at it in two lights. These are all areas that we all will experience in life. They're, I'm just going to call them circumstances. They're, they're, some are trials. Some are, are uh, tremendous suffering moments. But I'm just going to label it all as a circumstance, okay? For instance, tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I shared with the group Wednesday. Uh, uh, on Tuesday, I was headed to the office, and I stayed a little bit later. I had the girls coming over, and I wanted to, I think I fixed them breakfast. I can't remember why I stayed, but I wanted to, to be there when they got there. So I waited for them to drop the girls off and uh, had my little visit with them, and then I said, I got to go. I don't ever go the way that I went that day. I always go a different way when I drive a little black car. I go the least uh, death route <laughs> in, my, in, in my little coffin. And so uh, uh, I always go down Spring Hill. But this time, for some reason, I went the other way. I was going down 11. There's a, there's a long dip just before you get into Poppaville. There's a little creek, and then it goes up a hill. And it's kind of a long straight away. It's where everybody passes like maniacs there. And as I was coming down the bottom, I saw a girl, had her window down in her car, going about 10 miles an hour down Highway 11. I thought, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I'm, I, I, she's the one that's got my attention because she's driving so slow. So I'm just staring at her. And she pulls off, and she's on her cell phone. I said, well, she must have got a call. She pulled over, which is probably smart. Maybe, maybe we all should do that. And then I looked up, and I saw two, two pickup trucks slamming on brakes. And I thought, what on earth is going on? And then I looked about 50 yards up, and an uh, uh, SUV, identical to Tartar, it, it's black, but it's exactly like y'all's, but it's black. And uh, it had crashed into a tree kind of in the woods a little bit. You couldn't see it from where I was. It was fully enveloped in flames. Had just happened. It had just happened. Uh, you couldn't get anybody out. It, it was horrific. It was horrific. And uh, it shook me. I'm still shaking up, but it shook me up that day. And uh, when the EMTs got there, Charlie got some information finally because I never knew. But they broke in the back window, and they saw diapers on the floorboard, and then they thought, well, could there be a child? It was, the, the girl died in the wreck. I know it sounds terrible to say, thank you, Lord, but... You know, it, 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 was, it was dead. And it, it was in the paper, a little 20-year-old girl. Let me tell you something, guys. That was a circle. And when I called Tracy, it took me a while before I called her, and I said, pray. And I called Haley and them, too. I said, pray for the family because they're fixing to get the worst news that you possibly can get. And I said, you cannot plan for that kind of day. Okay. I know I'm going to call that a circumstance, but y'all do understand that's a horrific circumstance, right? Okay. These things happen, don't they? Two reactions can come our way to that. God can take an event like that and his faithfulness and his strength and his presence will allow us to learn things about him and his faithfulness that we would never have known had that terrible moment not come. That same 
incident can become a temptation for us to react sinfully. Anger toward God, worry, fear, what tomorrow holds. So circumstances can become one or two things. They can become a, a block that we can step up on and grow, or they can become a block that we stumble over and may fall. God never tempts us to sin. But God's circumstances that he allows in our life can cause us to be tempted to sin. Does that make sense? And, and I'm not trying to cop out for God here. I'm just telling you. We're the ones that make the reaction. Um, uh, in a moment like that, I, you know, I was sitting there thinking, um, and I, I'm just going to tell you how I thought. I said, if this is one of my family members, I would hope the first person that came up would have tried to get them out. Unfortunately, we were the first people that came up. The wreck had probably happened five minutes before that. So there had been no traffic. And when we got there, we had a vehicle completely on fire. And uh, it just, just was heart-wrenching. Okay, so you and I do not know what tomorrow holds. We could get a phone call. We could get a pink slip. It could be our best day ever. We could get the best news. But for the sake of fear, worry, and anxiety, I want us to think about some circumstances that can tempt us. We can either step up or we can trip down, okay? So here are some things that I want to say. These are, these are things in life that I guarantee you most of us, let me back off and say, probably all of us will encounter in our lives. Impending death. Impending death. I've always said that the ones who know that death is imminent are in a position, if their faculties are intact, they have time to prepare their hearts to stand before their Creator. Some people don't have that moment. Some people, like that young girl, are taken quickly without any thought. Uh, but when death is impending, I've gone, I remember one of our church members years when I first came here uh, was terminal and I had gone. I felt in my heart that they were saved, but, but I just I wanted to make sure that they knew the Lord. And, uh, and I went to minister to them and instead they ended up ministering to me. They were at such a peace with God. They were such a peace with where their life was. They were at such peace with their relationship with Jesus. And in that moment when our minds might be on 10,000 things a day, uh, uh, his mind was on dying. And in that, God had granted that comfort. But sometimes with impending death, it becomes that stumbling block where we worry about everything, things that are undone. and things that aren't going to be changed. And I see people sometimes uh, reacting in ways that don't even make sense, but it would make sense if you were in their shoes. Unexpected bills. Now you're on a budget, and you got about $100 at the end of each month, and you get a bill for 1000 What are we going to do? That can be a moment when you can trust the Lord. Ask him to give you discernment and wisdom, or you can fret and worry and become anxious and bitter and argue and scream at each other, which ain't going to pay that bill. But it's the sinful reaction that tends that to happen. If your income is suddenly reduced or you lose it, if you went to work tomorrow and they told you, we're downsizing, I was able to negotiate your job to continue but you're going to have to take a 30% cut in pay. So you still got a job, you still got your benefits, but it's going to be a whole lot less money. Do you fret and worry over that? You can. If you have an injury that may cause you an extended uh, a recovery or even one that may cause you to be crippled, if you have an illness that last longer than was anticipated. If you have surgery scheduled, 
that you're not real anxious about. All of these can create the worry and the fear. But God can also use those to give you peace, to prove his presence, to allow you to witness and to tell others. And then after you come through that ordeal, to be an encouragement to others who may be going through the same thing. A perceived loss of a relationship. Searching for a new church or a job or a home. Persecutions and threats. When your children grow up and they all leave. We've been through that. Now, a lot of you guys have. It wasn't easy, was it? No. But you know what you learn? You learn that God is faithful. And God, your, your life changes directions. And then grandkids show up and it starts all over again. So, pretty good deal. Sometimes you may find yourself in a very difficult job. Sometimes you may find yourself in a very difficult home situation. In all of these, we have two reactions. We can yield to the side of the enemy and flesh, and we can let it dishevel us. It can bring us to pure anxiety and worry. We, we, can, we can, folks, isn't it amazing how our imaginations can make up so much stuff to be afraid of that will almost guaranteed never happen? We just went through a whole lot of that with COVID, didn't we? A lot of fear. And with this election coming up, I think we're fixing to see another run of something. Okay? So where does all this fear and worry come from? And why is it considered a sinful reaction besides the fact that God tells us not to? But why on earth can it become so paralyzing? Okay, well, this is going to be truth bomb number two. <laughs> if you're living to please you, that's going to be the difficult place. If you're living to please God and to bring glory to Him, you will look at every circumstance in a different lens every single time. So it's who you're living to please. If you want to do the self-focus, which the Bible says we're to die to self, instead we're to fear God and then eventually have that empathy toward our brothers and sisters who may be going through similar instances. Everything that happens in our life, whether you plan it, it could, it could some things are the fruit that we're bearing because it's what we sowed. I mean, that's just... If, if you do sinful things and you reap sinful fruit, always remember this. Just because it ain't showing up now doesn't mean it's not coming. The, the sinful choices that we make uh, that produce the unwanted uh, occurrence in our life, that may create fear and worry and anxiety. But the truth is all that's coming because we did it. We're earning that. Some of it may be chastening too, by the way. It's not necessarily a circumstance that God could use. But God has the power to even take those and work out for uh, His glory and our good. But we're going to have to get over ourselves and let our attention be towards serving God, okay? Now, here are some biblical responses, some biblical responses to these circumstances that may have happened. And when we react in a spiritual manner, we'll see spiritual fruit, okay? So if we are fearing God and seeking after Him first, even, even circumstances, for some, it will bring them to salvation. Did you know that? Sometimes the Lord will take a circumstance and bring someone to the end of themselves to where they have nowhere to look but to Him. And I've seen people saved. I had a gentleman in a church I pastored. His wife had witnessed to him faithfully. She had begged God to save him. That man hated preachers. He didn't, he wasn't so much against the church. 
he just had something against preachers. I don't know if somebody might have, I think a preacher took advantage of him somewhere. It's all I could figure. And that wife did everything she could to get me and him together, and he resented it every chance that we got together. She finally, in frustration, said, Lord, whatever it takes, save my husband. Whatever it takes, save him. He was in a horrific car wreck. He was in a hospital for three months. In the time that he was in that hospital and suffering, Floyd became a Christian. He became a Christian. Isn't that good? I preached his funeral because the day he was discharged, they took a drain tube out that had grown through an intestine and he died. But he died saved. Amen. But he died saved. Folks, I'm telling you something. The Lord can bring people to salvation through unfavorable circumstances. When we reverence God and fear Him and our desire is that His name would be glorified, we will grow in wisdom and knowledge. We will learn what it is to be steadfast in the Lord. That means to remain solid and firm, immovable. When we are fearing and reverencing God instead of responding to fear and anxiety, the unknown, circumstance, whatever it may be, our health will improve. God will improve our health. Proverbs 3, 7, and 8, if you want to look that up. Life can be prolonged. We can have vitality. In other words, a, a victorious life, a confident life, like a fountain, Proverbs 14. We begin to understand that God has goodness and loving kindness that he turns toward us. You're never going to recognize any of that if you're afraid of everything and anxiety is ruling your heart. You become more convinced of the beauties of heaven and your eternity. You begin to recognize God's watch care over your life. You begin to understand that God protects you because he sustains you as you wait on Him instead of worry, which will produce nothing. You learn to receive blessings from the Lord through others. You become motivated because of your obedience to serve Him more. You sleep well at night. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Anxious. Fear, worry will rob you of your sleep. But when you know God's holding your life, you can sleep like a baby at night. You have not a fear in the world. And you build a confidence, not in yourself, but in the God whom you serve. So real quick, just this, I, may, I may have to expand this a little bit more. I just want to cover something, how to put some of this into practice. These are what happens when you do. This is what happens when you don't. So how on earth do you practice this? Now, I'm going to use terminology that I use in counseling, uh, and, I, and I shared it from the pulpit. But let me explain what a put off and a put on is. In Scripture, we see, especially in Paul's letters, there are many things that he tells us to put off. But he always comes back and tells us to put something on. So it's not a matter of stopping something. It's a matter of stopping, well, number one, it's a matter of recognizing it needs to be stopped. Then it is stopping it in obedience to God and His Word. And then it is replacing it. So you're putting off a behavior and you're putting on a, a behavior. Okay? So I'm going to go through a few of those and I think you'll understand what I mean. Okay? Now, if we're going to deal biblically with fear and anxiety and worry, the first thing we've got to start with is we've got to agree with God that these are sinful reactions to the things that are happening in our life. And that is called confession. And until we're willing 
to acknowledge that my fear and my worry and my anxiety are sinful reactions to circumstances. Until you confess that and until you come to that conclusion, none of the rest of this is going to matter. You have got to deal biblically with fear and worry and anxiety. And to do that, you confess the self-centeredness that you're having. You fit to the Lord too, not to me or to somebody else. And then you come back and you make a choice to trust the Lord and His watch care and His loving kindness and His protection and you claim His promises. Folks, I don't know why we don't claim the promises of God more than we do. We should. We can hold on to those. God does not lie. If God hath thus said, doesn't matter if we believe it or not, that settles it. God is not going to be untrue to His Word. Okay? So here's just the truth. We are not to worry, we're not to be anxious, and we're not to be fearful because we recognize that this reveals a lack of trust in God. And we realize that it's going to cause us to become spiritually barren. It's going to affect us mentally. It will affect us physically. But our bigger concern is the spiritual fruit in our relationship to the Lord. So what do we do? Well, if God has given us the power and has given us a sound mind, then we in Christ have the authority and the power to put off timid, fearful, troubled thinking. You can put it off. Preacher, I cannot do that. Step one, confess the behavior as sinful. Make a decision to honor the Lord in your thoughts, in what your mind is focused upon. If you've got to go back and do an inventory, there may be some areas of your life you need to get rid of and replace with better things. But you're feeding that fear somewhere. And in the end, it's because we don't trust God. And we don't believe that He's able. That's what it boils down to. So we've got to put that off. Now, if we're going to put off the timid, fearful, and troubled thinking, we're going to have to put on the love that God has toward us and know that whatever the circumstance is that's causing this, God will use it to grow us, to reveal more of Himself to us, He'll lift us up. It becomes a stepping stone. Uh, uh, not only that, He will give us sound judgment that is right thinking and discernment of what we're looking at and experiencing. And He will do it all in the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in each of us in Christ. Folks, I want to tell you, I'm a little passionate about this. <laughs> and if I hurt anybody's feelings, I'm not trying to. But I'm so sick unto death that I want to vomit that Christians do not accept the victorious life that God has given us. We can rise above all of this. We can live above it. We've got to start doing that. We've got to start doing that. We can do it in Christ, okay? Paul said that God gives us that power and love and a sound mind, which is the ability to have sound discipline and judgment. We can do that, okay? Paul also told young Timothy not to let his weaknesses stop him from ministering to others. His success as a minister with all of his physical ailments and all the anxiety that he dealt with, his success wasn't going to come on his personal ability it was going to be a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power working in His life. And the same is true for us. If we're going to come to a circumstance that may suck the life out of us, and instead we're going to fear God and honor Him and give Him the respect and worship, we're going to step up on that circumstance, and we are going to look at it in a way that God can use it to further His kingdom, to grow us, to bring glory to His name, to teach us things about Him we'd never know had that not happened, and we face it with confidence in Him. And guess what happens? The testimony of Christians living that way encourage other Christians to live that way. It builds. Oh, how we need that. We recognize that in our relationship with Jesus, 
he has given us peace that passes all understanding. That peace will show up when your understanding's over. And you've been, some of you have been there where God gave you a peace that you cannot explain. That's his presence in your life, okay? Well, Brother Bud, what, what, about, what about a year from now? What, how is this going to affect us a year from now? Well, there's another put off. Put off your self-centered concern about your future because you don't know what your future holds. But guess what? God knows exactly what your future holds. I, mean, I said this other night in the sermon. I said it just as sort of a side note, but it was really a deep point. We can either focus our heart on our circumstances or we can focus our heart on the God who controls our circumstances. Let's choose the other, okay? And then keep doing the Word of God. Keep doing the Word of God. As you're doing that, give yourself to prayer and thanksgiving. I want to just close with the verse I quoted, but I want to read the whole thing. One of my favorite verses, by the way, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. I want you to listen to it. If we can bring that up on the screen, that is a little, okay. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. So, so don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Prayer and supplication. Prayer is, is calling out to God. Supplication is, is bringing our needs to Him, laying them out. Some people say, well, well do I just keep doing that? Sometimes we, some, some would say that's a lack of faith. If you're confident in God's provision, and you bring out of a heart that is troubled your needs repetitively to God, that is not declining that you don't have faith. And I believe that God would understand your weaknesses. So I would say keep bringing them until something happens. Okay? So be anxious for nothing and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. As you're making your needs known to God, the thanksgiving is calling you to remember how faithful God is. We leave the thanksgiving part out. God, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle this anymore. This is more than I can handle. I need you. I'm praying. Brother Bud said pray. I'm praying. Here's my list of needs. I'm bringing them. But we don't take time to say, thank you, Lord for bringing me through this trial. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me through this. Thank you, Lord, for restoring me after this. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for the faithfulness that I saw in this person's life. See how the difference is? When we do it with thanksgiving, we're recalling and remembering. But look, it goes further than that. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart, and it will guard your mind through Christ Jesus. That is the very source, your imagination and your thought processes. This is the very place that Satan paralyzes you with fear and worry because it is a sinful reaction to a circumstance that stops you. And then look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are pure and whatever things are noble and whatever things are just and whatever things are, are, are pure, uh, true, I said true, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, or virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That was that inventory that I kind of started with. If you're going to put your mind to something, to the fact of, to the place of paralysis, let it be, get carried away with the things that are pure and lovely and virtuous and true. Focus on those things. Y'all remember that old Gaither song? When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and all your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it goes on to say those chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they'll drop powerless behind you. We've got to get that song. 
It's a good one. It's a Gaither song. When you praise the Lord. That is a good song to know. That is one of my favorite songs. That's in the classic praise that I've been listening to. Praise the Lord. Learn to. Folks, Satan has a scheme to paralyze any of us in fear, anxiety, and worry because he knows how prone we are. Let's resist him in that area, okay? I hope this has helped somebody tonight. And if it, if, if, if it hasn't, but it's begun, don't let go of this. Dwell on this a little bit. Are we recording tonight so this will be available? Get a recording of this. Spend some time in it. If you need to come see me personally, we'll work through some things. I got some homework to do on this area, and we, we can do some serious scripture searching because God doesn't want you to be paralyzed by fear. Satan wants to keep you there. God has given us victory over that, okay? Let's bow. Father, teach us your word. Teach us your will. Help us to take our eyes off the idols and the things that we covet and the things that we think will make us happy and help us to turn our hearts to you. Lord, many people don't understand the fear of you. But Lord, when we begin to contemplate the God who has been revealed, how you revealed yourself in Scripture, Lord, it will, it will just cause us to skip a step. God, you're so holy and you're so pure. Lord, you're a God of wrath and a God of love. You're a God of justice, but you're also a God of vengeance. Lord, help us to take these attributes that you reveal about yourself and let it shape our lives and our worship. Help it to, Lord, that we wouldn't look to the world or the things of the world to shape our mindset, but that we would look intently on your word, that we'd hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Lord, that we would hide your word in our heart that we might live that victorious life, that we'd begin to understand the things that happen around us as circumstances that you permit and allow in our life. Lord, your word has never said that life would be easy. Your word tells us that you've overcome this world that we live in. And Lord, we know the hope that we have and the eternity that is ours in Christ Jesus. So Lord, as we live this life, help us to live it in the victory and the honor and the glory of our Savior. And Lord, I pray for the one in this room tonight that may be paralyzed by fear and anxiety. That, Lord, that they have allowed this to, to not only to stop their enjoyment of living, but it has literally put them in a prison. And I pray, Lord, tonight that enough light has been shed on this that they would understand that, that they have been living in a place they don't have to. Lord, teach us what it is to be victorious in our lives. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for it. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.